Welcome to The Mushroom Show. My name is Tony Shields. This is episode 28, and this is the one place where you need to be if you want to stay on top of all the cool things happening in the world of mushrooms. This one will be super fun, kind of a variety show episode covering some of the breaking stories in mushrooms, including something involving mushroom genetics, more bad headlines and relatively ridiculous regulations, and finishing off with a curious connection between the state of Texas and the country of Japan in our weird mushroom segment. So if you like mushrooms, if you like the mushroom show please go ahead and hit that like button it really does help the channel grow and if you want to see future episodes of the show go ahead and hit that subscribe button as well let's jump into the show i've been seeing this article pop up a lot recently about psilocybe cubensis and it is kind of a bit of a clickbaity headline based on what's actually being reported but the title is designer shrooms could be coming as scientists unlock the genetics of magic mushrooms and it says the findings could help researchers develop mushrooms with unique psychedelic compounds but it is still pretty cool. It's basically talking about a paper that was recently published in the Journal of Current Biology by Australian scientists titled Domestication Through Clandestine Cultivation Constrained Genetic Diversity in Magic Mushrooms Relative to Naturalized Populations. Now again, this is all in reference to Psilocybe cupensis, which can kind of be thought of as like the default cultivated version of magic mushrooms. This is the species behind well-known strains like Golden Teacher, Be Positive, Malabar Coast, and so forth. All of these strains that you hear or strains that you see when people are buying spores, for example, this is all Psilocybe cubensis. And what the scientists did in this paper was they took a bunch of these cultivated varieties and analyzed the DNA, analyzed them genetically, and then compared them to wild versions of the same mushroom to see if there is large variations in the genetic diversity. So they took 86 strains of the domesticated variety. So again, strains that you might see at the dispensaries like Malabar, Golden Teacher, blue meanies and so forth and using DNA analysis compared them to 38 wild varieties that have been isolated from Australia and what they found was that there was plenty of variation within the wild varieties or the wild strains but there was almost no genetic variation whatsoever within the commonly cultivated strains according to one of the paper's authors Alistair McTaggart he says what was surprising was the extreme homozygosity of some cultivars of magic mushroom some of these cultivars have been nearly stripped of any diversity except their genes controlling sexual reproduction. Now this does make sense when you think about it intuitively that wild varieties are going to have a lot more genetic variation because well they're always adapting to different things there might be a lot more crossbreeding and all these kind of things whereas if you take the same strain and you just cultivate it over and over and over again well that's going to cause for genetic similarity across a lot of those strains or homozygosity as it said in the paper. But what is the real significance here? What were they trying to discuss Discover with this study and how could it lead to these so-called designer shrooms as was mentioned in the headlines. Well the genetic makeup of different strains of psilocybin containing mushrooms is responsible for the levels and ratios of active compounds within the mushroom. Not just psilocybin but also other potentially psychoactive compounds. Things like norbeocystin, baocystin, and also psilocin. So if the genetic diversity of cultivated varieties can be enhanced through crossbreeding with with more strains that are more genetically diverse, and if we can understand which genetic traits are responsible for the production of these compounds, this could lead to advanced breeding, designer cultivars, otherwise known as designer shrooms. Alistair McTaggart, who was quoted in the article, is the chief scientific officer of a research group in Australia called Funky Fungus, who does have approval to grow these mushrooms and do research on them. The idea being that if they can better understand these mushrooms and the compounds inside, and how they vary, this can then lead to these mushrooms being potentially more useful in a medicinal sense. So you may have heard the saying that a cube is a cube, meaning basically that any strain of Psilocybe cubensis is the same as any other strain of Psilocybe cubensis, but with some of this research and with a better understanding of the genetic makeup of these mushrooms, this could lead to advanced breeding, which could mean that a cube is not necessarily just a cube, otherwise known as designer shrooms, so it'll be interesting to see where this research leads. On to our next story. Now, we talked a couple episodes ago about the potential outsized impact of negative 
negative news media headlines involving psilocybin mushrooms. This was after the case of the Alaskan Airlines pilot who was apparently under the influence of mushrooms, or more specifically, a mushroom-induced psychotic break when he tried to shut down the engines mid-flight. But more recently, there was another headline that read, Massachusetts student jumped out of a six-story window after taking illegal magic mushrooms. Massachusetts police said the teenager was severely injured. And yes, I can imagine that would have hurt. I do hope the student was okay. But reading more into this story, it seems to be more about a nefarious dealer that thought it was a good idea to go to the dispensaries, get a bunch of stuff, and then turn around and sell it to kids. But again, similar to the Alaskan Airlines story, the details don't really matter all that much because most people won't read beyond the headlines which places the blame squarely on the mushrooms. I can't help but be reminded here of a story from about 15 years ago from the Netherlands where psilocybin mushrooms were once legal in which a 17 year old student who was visiting from France jumped off a building after eating psychedelic mushrooms resulting in her death and which contributed to the complete ban of psilocybin mushrooms by the Dutch government several months later. So is this same thing going to happen in the US? Well, psilocybin mushrooms aren't legal in the US yet anyways, so it's not like it could result in a ban, but I do think this kind of attention might slow some of the progress that psilocybin is making and it also highlights the importance of considering what a safe rollout or a safe version of legalized psilocybin mushrooms would actually look like. Now speaking of rolling out the potential legalization of psilocybin, I did come across another article which really highlighted to me why this is going to be difficult no matter what. Because on one hand there is the realities of what these mushrooms actually are and on the other hand there is the interpretation of these realities that is probably going to cause a lot more fuss and a lot more debate than is actually required. For example, debating whether or not they can or should be grown on poop. This headline actually says, Poop Talk state officials consider manure in magic mushrooms. A lot of vegetables that people eat is grown on manure, so I'm not sure how this would be any different. And maybe this is just a mischaracterization of how mushrooms are cultivated, how these mushrooms are actually grown, or maybe it's a mischaracterization of how vegetables are grown. I don't know how many vegetables are actually grown on poop. Maybe correct me if I'm wrong. But either way, it kind of shows the importance, or I guess the downside of people making rules or creating laws around things that they might not fully understand. It reminds me of when Oregon lawmakers were discussing the regulations for their rollout and wanted to ensure that mushrooms weren't grown on wood because of fear of wood lovers paralysis, which was a misinterpretation of the condition. Now to be fair, we don't really know what causes wood lovers paralysis or if it's caused by mushrooms at all, but for sure we know that it's not caused from Psilocybe cubensis mushrooms that are grown on wood. But if Oregon lawmakers want to make sure they're not grown on wood and Colorado lawmakers want to make sure that they're not grown on manure, what should they actually be grown on? Now the truth is that Psilocybe cubensis are a dung loving mushroom and in the wild they do grow on cow poop. And I use the term wild loosely because they are domesticated in a way, only growing on cow poop which would be on a farm and it is pretty cool to see. They literally just sprout out from the cow pie after a good rain. And if that was the case, like if people in Colorado wanted to just grow them straight on cow poop or pick them straight off a of cow poop, then yeah, I could kind of see some concerns there, maybe with E. coli or maybe with some other contamination in the cow poop that might end up in the mushrooms and make people sick. But the way they are actually cultivated, if wanting to use manure, is completely different. Manure is more used as maybe an additive to the substrate, which adds more nutrition, and this substrate is usually pasteurized or sterilized completely, so it's not like you would have those concerns. And let's not forget forget that the most commonly consumed mushroom in the entire country is Agaragus bisporus, a mushroom that is cultivated on composted manure. It's just how some mushrooms grow. So you shouldn't imagine the mushrooms just being picked right off of a cow patty because unless you're literally getting them from a ranch, that's not how it's done. Now the article does talk about some of the benefits of growing on manure, including the fact that it might help them grow better and it is similar to some traditional methods and that some other substrates are not all that sustainable, such as coca choir or vermiculite, but really growing mushrooms on coca choir and vermiculite is a pretty tried and true method. And mushrooms in general can be adapted to grow amazingly well on all sorts of sterile substrates. I think the bottom line on this is that deciding what the mushrooms should grow on compared to all the other decisions that need to be made is probably not that important. Now the other thing I found kind of funny about this article and a good example about how legislators can kind of just get in their own way 
was they were talking about the waste management of psilocybin mushroom production and worrying about psilocybin potentially getting in the water supply. Right from the article, it says psilocybin is water soluble and remains active in water unless it's exposed to heat or other filtration techniques. They also mentioned concern about substrate removal, saying since spores can remain active and refruit inside of compost bins, they may also travel through the air once commercial cultivation begins. It finishes by recommending that growers should keep their operations indoors to prevent potential spore spread. And this is kind of funny to think about, like the concept or the idea that somehow the waste stream from a psilocybin psilocybin mushroom farm would have any amount of psilocybin that would somehow get into the water supply that other people might be drinking downstream, that is kind of laughable. I mean, it would be such a de minimis amount of psilocybin that it would for sure not even be detectable. And I don't think this could be a concern. But the other funny thing is this idea that mushroom spores somehow, if they're growing outside, would end up growing all over the place and would see psilocybin mushrooms growing all over Colorado. I mean, mushrooms are easy to grow, but they're not that easy to grow. So I don't think that would be a concern. And even the idea of like trying to make sure mushroom growers grow mushrooms inside to contain the spores, well, that's not gonna really work either mushroom spores are pretty good at getting out anywhere. I think anyone that has grown mushrooms before knows this, especially with mushrooms like oysters or even Psilocybe cubensis, any mushroom that has a reasonable spore load, spores are going to get everywhere. Now, a lot of this seems to be kind of talking about talking and making rules for the purposes of making rules, but still, I think we can give a lot of leeway here because as we've talked about many times on this show, this is all kind of new. Not only the use of psilocybin mushrooms, the rollout of them, but now also how they could be or should be grown and it's not immediately obvious that spores leaking out of a farm won't be a problem or that psilocybin in the water supply won't be a problem and hopefully we can get more people involved maybe Colorado has some mushroom farmers that want to chime in and uh, make this whole process make a lot more sense moving on to our next segment starting with a question that maybe you have never thought about before and that's what do Texas and Japan have in common well they both have high-speed rail and they're both prone to natural disasters what with the tornadoes and the hurricanes in Texas and the tsunamis and the earthquakes in Japan but there is another thing that unites these two disparate places. The appearance of one of the rarest mushrooms in the world, Coriolactis giaster, otherwise known as the Texas star fungus, which has recently made an appearance in the Lone Star State. I wanted to include this in a quick weird mushrooms segment because it is a mushroom that has perplexed scientists for ages. Now, first of all, is this mushroom that special otherwise? Is it some delicious edible? Is it perhaps psychoactive? Is there any other reason why somebody would want to go and hunt this mushroom down? Well, no, not really. It's part of the vast, vast majority of mushrooms that aren't delicious edibles or medicinal or anything like that, but it does look super cool. You can see a picture of it here, and as you can tell, it has this star-like shape, which is why it's called the Texas Star, and also why the Lone Star State chose it to be the official state mushroom in 2021. But it doesn't always look that way. It starts off as a more kind of elongated big seed-looking type thing that bursts into a super cool star pattern when it wants to share its spores. But what does make it weird and super scientifically interesting is the question of why would this one mushroom have such a unique bifurcated pattern of distribution? And I know what you're thinking, right? This was clearly just a case of introduction. So somebody from Japan came over to Texas and brought the mushroom or vice versa. But this was actually proven to not be the reason why. In 2004, a study actually compared the DNA sequences of the two populations and discovered that these two populations have been separated for at least 19 million years. Now this obviously rules out the idea of human introduction. It is saprobic, so it's not mycorrhizal, meaning that it does derive its nutrition from decaying matter. But in Texas, they appear to grow on the roots or stumps of elm trees and in areas where there is periodic flooding, where in Japan, the host is typically oak and it doesn't grow in areas with periodic flooding. Finally, this mushroom is included on a short list of about 15 different species worldwide that will emit a distinct hissing sound when they distribute their spores. According to a 1996 article in Mycologist, spore release is accompanied by an audible hiss. Having heard this several times in the field, we can attest to the fact that the sound can easily be heard from a distance of several feet. This substantial cloud of spores that explodes from this mushroom is the reason why it's also called the devil's cigar, 
which is another common name for this uncommon mushroom. And that's it for this episode of The Mushroom Show. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for being here. This is a whole new year for The Mushroom Show and I'm super, super excited about that. If you have any ideas of uh, episodes you'd like to see, different segments you'd like to see, different topics you'd like discussed, maybe even different guests that you'd like to see appear on The Mushroom Show, please let me know in the comments below. And again, if you like mushrooms, if you like The Mushroom Show, please go ahead and hit that like button. It really helps the channel grow. And if you wanna see future episodes of the show, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button as well. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one.